Okay, hi there. Uh, there are many areas of the economics course uh, where you can bring the concept of consumer surplus into your analysis and strengthen your evaluation and assessments. So I thought I'd choose four examples, three from micro and one from macro, to show you how you can use consumer surplus in your economics exam assessments. Quick reminder of what the, uh, the term consumer surplus means. It's the difference between the price that people are willing and able to pay for a good or a service. And that, of course, is reflected in the, the private benefit curve or the demand curve. The difference between that and the total amount uh, they actually do pay, which is the price per unit multiplied by the quantity. And how do we show the amount of consumer surplus that's going to be important? Well, it's the area underneath the demand curve and above the price. It's normally a triangle. The area underneath the demand curve and above the prevailing market price. Keep in mind, however, this assumes that the price charged is the same for all units consumed. And of course, uh, things like uh, price discrimination by a monopolist drops this assumption because they start charging different prices to different consumers for essentially the same product. So here we go. Let's look at four examples of how you can use consumer surplus. I do encourage my students to bring this idea into their analysis. I think it helps to develop a diagram and it gets you to a higher level of, of response. Let's look first of all at the impact of an indirect tax imposed by the government. Uh, we'll consider, for example, here a specific tax shown by the vertical distance between the tax per unit uh, uh, pre-tax supply and post-tax supply. So here's our diagram showing the impact of a tax. Hopefully you've revised this area of the year 12 micro syllabus. Consumer surplus before the tax, where well, the original price was uh, was D, the equilibrium point F, quantity Q1. The area of consumer surplus was area A, D, F. The area underneath the demand curve and above the price. Now, because of the tax, well, the price has gone up to B. So it's gone up from D to B and the quantity is contracted from Q1 to Q2. So now consumer surplus after the tax is area A, B, C. Consumers having to pay a higher price, meaning there's been a loss of consumer surplus of area B, C, F, D. If you get a question on indirect taxes, of course, the, alternative, the opposite of being a subsidy, but if you get a question on indirect taxes, do include the consequences for consumer surplus. Great idea to build into your analysis. How about, uh, well, let's move on to let's move on to a couple of applications from year 13 micro. And our focus this time is going to be on price regulation uh, for a monopoly. So here's our diagram. We're going to assume we are dealing with a profit maximizing monopolist. I'm assuming a constant cost uh, business where the marginal and the average cost of supply is the same. It's just a simplifying assumption. Makes diagrams much easier to draw in the A-level exam. The original profit maximizing output is Q1 here. The price is OB and the output is Q1. Therefore, the consumer surplus at this price and output is area A, B, C. By the way, the area B, C, F, D, of course, will be monopoly profit, super normal profit. Now, it could be the case that the regulator or the government decides perhaps they might nationalize the business, but the regulator may impose a lower price in a bid to improve consumer welfare. So let's say the regulator or the government might regulate, impose a lower price of OD to improve allocative efficiency. You see, price OD is where marginal cost and the average revenue curve meet. That is the output Q2 of allocative efficiency. If they do that, well, obviously there are consequences for profit. Monopoly profit is essentially regulated away in this situation. But consumer surplus rises to the area A. D, E at output Q2. So what I'm saying here is, if you get a question on price regulation of a monopoly, then don't be afraid to bring consumer surplus into your analysis. It helps to develop your diagram. Third example, let's look at the impact of economies of scale in the long run. What impact does that have on consumer surplus? Often these questions come up, assess, evaluate the impact of economies of scale on on a market. Well, let's take another constant cost example, MC1 equals AC1, a profit maximizing price of B at output Q1. So this is the original profit maximizing price and at that output and price, consumer surplus is area A, B, 
C, then we get the area underneath the demand curve and above the price. Now, with economies of scale, of course, the unit costs of production come down. Let's assume it's got a big fall in unit cost. Other things remaining the same, or keter as paribus, economies of scale leads to an increase in the profit maximizing output from Q1 to Q2, and a fall in the price charged by the firm from uh, OB to OD. And of course, that will have consequences for profit, well, not necessarily the focus of this, this video, but also for consumer welfare. With economies of scale, the profit maximizing output rises to Q2 and the price falls to OD. Can you see the new level of consumer surplus there? The new level of consumer surplus is, is ADE, an increase of B, C, E, D. Great diagram to draw. Economies of scale, in theory, can lead to an improvement in consumer welfare as shown by an increase in consumer surplus. OK, let's uh, finish off by thinking about a macro example. Again, always trying to encourage my students to bring welfare concepts into play. Let's look at the trade liberalisation agreement diagram. So consider, consider uh, for example, a trade deal between two or more countries that eliminates, takes away an import tariff on cars. So you may well be familiar with the tariff diagram. Well, of course, trade liberalisation is reversing that. It's eliminating the price that was existing with a tariff. So with a tariff, the average price for cars is B. Domestic demand is Q2. Domestic supply will be Q1, by the way. But domestic demand is Q2 and consumer surplus is area A, B, C. Of course, if you take away a tariff, you've just got to reverse engineer the diagram. And as a result of that, the world price without a tariff falls from B to D. And of course, with prices now lower, uh, after the tariff is eliminated, the price falls, domestic demand is, is now able to expand to Q3. Consumers can afford to buy more cars because import prices have come down. Quantity of demand goes up to Q3. As a result, consumer surplus grows to area A, D, E. Again, of consumer surplus of B, C, E, D. Now, there's much more to this diagram, you know, loss of tax revenue, impact on domestic producers. I'm sure there's much more you would think about. But the point I'm trying to make here is that if you get a question on trade liberalisation and you're trying to talk about the impact on consumers, don't be afraid. Have the confidence to introduce uh, the concept of consumer surplus into your analysis. And there's my point, really. If you get the chance, bring consumer surplus into your analysis. It's an important measure of economic welfare. It's a great way of boosting those marks, getting higher marks in those all-important assessments. OK, many more exam technique uh, videos to come as we head towards the assessments in the summer. Uh, but thank you for joining me on this one.